All right, chapter 31. Chapter 31 is trauma to the head, neck, and spine. Uh, when you couple this chapter with the chapter on thoracoabdominal trauma or chest and abdomen trauma, um, those are the two chapters that uh, really tend to kill the majority of our trauma patients that we deal with. It's not the bleeding wounds and shock in most cases. It's not the musculoskeletal injuries in most cases. It's the head, neck, spine, and the abdomen and chest. So this chapter uh, will cover, obviously, the neurosystem. Uh, so trauma to the neurosystem tends to be a, a huge killer. We have our objectives on pages 746 and 747. We have about 13 of those for this chapter. A couple multimedia videos over spinal injuries and the KED overview video. You should pay close attention to the KED overview video um, because KED is a device that we'll be uh, practicing using in uh, skills days and the KED or Kendrick extrication device, more appropriately referred to as a vest style immobilization device. KED is a brand name. Um, but the KED uh, is a, a somewhat complicated piece of equipment. It takes a little bit to get used to using and you have to be kind of careful when you're doing it. So it would be very beneficial to take a good close look at that. So the core concepts for the chapter include understanding the anatomy of the nervous system, the head, and the spine, understanding that the skull and brain injuries and those emergency care items, understanding wounds to the neck and the care for those, to the spine and the associated care with those, and then uh, immobilization issues and how to immobilize various types of patients with a potential spine injury. So the nervous system, if you recall, controls our thought, our sensations, and our motor functions. It's divided basically into the two major sections being the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is simply the brain and the spinal cord. Everything else is peripheral. So that means the vertebral nerves are those that come off of the spinal cord and head out to the various areas of the body. The cranial nerves, which actually come off of the base of the brain, and then the body's motor and sensory nerves. So the anatomy of the head, remember we have the cranium and the facial bones. The cranium and the facial bones make up the uh, skull. So we have the uh, cranium really encasing the brain and the facial bones giving us uh, obviously most of our functional features um, uh, outside of the the brain, so the mandible and the maxilla, which have to do with your mouth and chewing. The nasal bones are obviously for um, our sense of smell. And then the malar bones are the zygomatics, uh, which give us the cheekbones. And then to remember that the spine has uh, roughly 32 uh, vertebrae to it. and. Uh, the vertebrae are composed of cervical, thoracic, sacral, and coccyx or coccygeal uh, vertebrae. And when we add those all together, uh, we have uh, seven cervical making up the neck, 12 thoracic, one for each pair of ribs, five lumbar, which are your lower back, uh, that's the, the heaviest, thickest ones, five sacral, which are usually fused together uh, to form the back of your pelvis, and the four cosageal, which are generally fused as well, which compose your tailbone. So when we talk about injuries to the skull and the brain, scalp injuries, scalp injuries have lots and lots of blood vessels, so there's usually profuse bleeding. This is a fairly significant uh, injury here that they're showing us in the, the picture. Uh, it's obviously full thickness down through the, the skin, and uh, it may even be into the bone tissue there. It's tough to say. Uh, from this angle, but uh, so typically we have a lot of profuse bleeding. Anywhere that you grow hair, you have lots and lots of blood vessels, um, and then uh, obviously those blood vessels will uh, will bleed and bleed and bleed when injured. Uh, when we talk sc skull injuries, though, we're looking at two basic types of, of injuries: open versus closed head injury. Um, an open 
wound obviously has a penetrating trauma from the outside into the cranial vault or the cavity where the brain is found. And the closed head injury obviously doesn't have that opening. Now there's, it may seem to be a no-brainer, no pun intended, may seem to be a no-brainer that um, people would think that, oh, well, the closed head injury's got to be better because you're not exposing your brain to the outside world. When in reality, sometimes the closed head injury, when we don't actually crack the skull, doesn't allow for any swelling uh, or any buildup of blood within the brain. So if you have a completely intact skull, the brain is injured, it begins to bleed and swell, there's really only one place for it to go, and that's out through the frame and magnum in the base of the skull. And in these cases, uh, it normally has extremely, extremely bad outcomes. Sometimes with open head injuries, uh, we crack that skull. Uh, we do allow it to uh, swell a bit, and uh, it's kind of a relief port, more or less, by having uh, those bones broken. Whether or not um, we actually puncture through the skin, uh, that's usually kind of the uh, the tell right there. Is sometimes you can have skull injuries; you have fractures to the skull, but the skin is intact. That would probably be your best bet because it protects the brain from the outside world. Yet, with the broken bones of the skull, it allows the swelling to occur. So when we talk about brain injuries, we generally refer to them as traumatic brain injuries, or TBIs. Um, there's a number of those types of injuries that we run into, concussions, contusions, uh, and contusions could be a coup or counter-coup, or sometimes we have a, a, a both, coup, counter-coup, and injury. Lacerations to the brain and hematomas in the forms of subdural, epidermal, and intracerebral hematomas. So lots of different types to, to touch on here. Um, it's a little video on the intracranial pressure and what it does in the brain. Watch that. Um, I guess we lost a couple slides there. So concussions, concussions are really kind of a bump on the noggin that cause uh, things to kind of temporarily disrupt, but it's really not a permanent injury per se. You can have injuries. Uh, you can have concussion injuries over time, uh, and repetitive concussion injuries will build up uh, and have uh, what they're now finding to have um, lasting long-term health effects in the end. But in, in really uh, a lot of cases, it causes uh, a little amnesia. Really, it's mostly headaches and uh, some loss of coordination for some time. Um, and then normal ladies are pretty self-limiting, and they end up coming out of them in pretty pretty decent shape. A contusion is actually a bruise, so there's been a little uh, opening of uh, the blood vessels. The brain begins, uh, has a little bit of area of bleeding in it. Usually it is also self-limiting. Might fracture or rupture a couple of little blood vessels there, causes a, a little bleed. The coup, counter-coup injuries. Um, coup would be from when your head uh, hits something. So let's say you're not wearing a seat belt. Uh, you slam forward uh, and your head hits the windshield. Your brain bounces forward, hits the front of your skull, which would be, I guess be the inside of the front of your skull or the um, frontal bone of the skull. And that area of the brain is injured. That is the coup injury. A contra-coup injury would be then sometimes, and like I said, sometimes we get both, a contra-coup injury would be when then our, we uh, kind of sit back, uh, we hit our, hit our head on the windshield, we kind of fall back into the seat a little bit, and the brain is still moving around in there, and it actually then slams backwards. It kind of bounces off the front, causes the coup, and slams backward and hits the occipital bone of the brain, um, causing uh, there to be kind of more or less a whiplash injury of the brain itself, not of the neck, but uh, kind of this whipped around, and uh, that is the contra coup. So you can have a bruise on the front and the back of your brain at the same time from one incident, and you would have a coup and contra coup injury. 
obviously you can have a laceration uh, or a cut uh, in the brain and uh, this causes uh, sometimes if we have broken uh, shards of skull that would be the most common thing to uh, to lacerate the brain also people don't realize this but if you take the brain out and look at the floor of the the cranium you have oftentimes um, kind of jagged ridges in there the brain just kind of sits down upon so it could potentially cause that as well and then a hematoma is a little bit uh, bigger bruise per se where you have a, a more significant uh, collection of blood within those tissues um, and you can have a couple of different places subdural epidural or intracerebral um, the subdural and epidural that depend on what side of the dura matter and if you remember the dura matter uh, the, the other name for that is the hard mother but that's the outermost protective layer of the brain so if you have a subdural it is below the dura or close to the brain and if you have an epidural it's actually between the dura and the skull itself and then you can have an intracerebral hem hematoma which would be somewhere within the actual brain tissue as opposed to the outer coatings or coverings but this intracerebral hematoma causes bleeding then within that brain tissue alright so does my patient have a serious or potentially serious head injury and should the patient be transported to a trauma center um, if you have a patient who you strongly are suspicious of a head injury trauma center uh, if you can get there within 20 minutes or so it should be high priority for you uh, simply for the fact that um, most small town hospitals cannot handle somebody who needs neurosurgery um, in order to be a level one trauma center you have to be you have to have a neurosurgeon on hand basically all the time and then do my patients complaints and mechanism of injury indicate spinal immobile stabilization and is immobilization warranted? Almost always when you have a head injury, you should be strongly suspicious of a spinal injury. Because remember, you have this heavy object suspended on seven little tiny vertebrae of the cervical vertebrae, um, and they're responsible for keeping it all upright. Everything else in there is pretty much soft tissue. you got you know, large blood vessels. You have uh, large uh, structures uh, of the trachea. Um, large structures for uh, respiration, you have the esophagus, um, and so for the most part you have very little support there. So if it's enough to give them a head injury, in most cases we also strongly consider a spinal injury. So many injuries to the head and face. Uh, the cranial injuries uh, with impaled objects. We need to stabilize that object in place unless we're talking about something that's interfering with the airway and if we have something that's interfering with the airway we need to take steps to protect that airway whether that be um, removing that object and in most cases if we're strongly suspicious of it of a airway involvement we need to be working on getting those airways um, protected now that means probably removing an unpaled object and uh, then having to do the, the various damage control that comes with that, which normally means doing a little dressing on the inside and on the outside so you can prevent uh, the blood from accumulating. So injuries with the face and jaw specifically, um, a lot of the bones in the face are very fine bones, particularly around the nose. So there are some of them that are just barely thicker than paper, um, so those are very, very easy to damage. Uh, anything around the nose obviously has a significant amount of blood supply which can leak into the, the airway causing some potential harm. Um, getting a good whack to the face, you can break out the teeth, you can cause lacerations and whatnot causing a lot of bleeding into the mouth. So again, airway becomes a, a huge concern here. Occasionally we also have non-traumatic brain injuries. Um, Many signs of the brain injury can be caused by an internal brain event, so such as a hemorrhage or a blood clot. So we may have an aneurysm or a blood clot causing a stroke. Um, they're going to look exactly the same. The only difference is there's no evidence of trauma and no mechanism of injury. So it's going to be one of those cases in which the um, patient just wakes up usually with a headache. 
and even going back through, uh, or they maybe develop a, a headache while they're awake, but um, they going back to their, their history, they can't come up with any recent falls or accidents or assaults or whatnot. So you can have that non-traumatic brain injury, and in most cases uh, we refer to that as a stroke. So the Glasgow Coma Scale, the Glasgow Coma Scale is actually intended for use on trauma patients and for patients with neurologic trauma uh, that is causing changes to their mental status. So you can use GCS in addition to the AVPU for the ongoing neurologic assessment. It is not without limitations. Um, I, I many times have spoken out very, um, out very uh, upfront about I think the Glasgow Coma Scale is flawed, but yet we don't have a better system. So considerations, the things we're looking at for the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, include eye opening, verbal response, and the motor response. And this actually helps us gauge the patient's um, mental status. And if you look on page 760 in your textbook, it actually shows you the little chart that goes with the Glasgow Coma Scale. Now, eye-opening, if you would take a moment and look at that, you'll notice that that actually is AVPU. So it's spontaneous, verbal, to pain, and no response. So A, V, P, and U, that is the first category in the Glasgow Coma Scale. So if they're alert, they get a four. Second is verbal response. Um, when we're trying to converse with the patient, what do we get back from them? Do we get oriented, uh, or oriented, I should say, oriented conversation that basically uh, is right on? Do we get confused conversation? Maybe we're getting words that um, are close, but uh, the patient's really kind of stumbling and struggling. Do we get inappropriate words? Maybe you're asking them about their injury and they're telling you about their kite. Um, and uh, incomprehensible sounds, groans and grunts and whatnot. And then finally, none. So you score them wherever they're at with that. And then motor response obeys command. If you ask them, squeeze my fingers. You know, you check and see a sound. Squeeze my fingers. Uh, open your eyes. Uh, wag your tongue back side to side. Whatever. Uh, they obey your command. They get a six. They localize pain. So if you start to um, do something uh, that is painful, maybe you uh, pinch their nail bed um, or uh, pinch the webbing of their between their thumb and their forefinger. Uh, do they uh, reach for it and try to swatch you away? Or if you do cause some some pain, do they just kind of try to roll away from it? Well, that would be withdrawals. Um, flexion and extension. Um, these are two responses. And if you look now, we have switch switch back to 753 for a moment. You see decorticate, which is flexion, uh, flexion and decerebrate posturing, which is extension. Um, those two posturings uh, indicate uh, significant brain injury. Uh, flexion is slightly better than extension. Uh, neither one of them is a good thing, but uh, if we cause a little pain, uh, if they're initially unresponsive, we cause a little pain and we see them start to either flex or extend, uh, then uh, that obviously rates them pretty low there. And then if we get absolutely no response, we get a one. Uh, the reason why I, I struggle with this is because of the fact that if you have somebody who has a tracheostomy and they don't have a speaking valve in, something called a passing weir valve, they don't have that speaking valve in, you, they get no verbal response. Even though they might be perfectly capable of telling you everything you need to know and uh, are functioning just fine, by the na very nature of this scale, they instantly get docked four points because they can't respond. So do not spend extra time at the scene calculating the GCS. It's a nice to know. It's not a mandatory to know. Um, trauma centers do kind of push it. The problem with another problem with GCS is if you give them a number, you add up all three. So if you had a, a four for eye opening, a three for verbal response, and a five for motor response, so we get a 4, 3, 5, would give us a 12. If you got a GCS of 12, that really doesn't tell you much. There's several different ways you can come up with a 12 by adding those numbers up. 
the other problem is is outside of the emergency room, nobody else uses the Glasgow Coma Scale, and most nurses don't know it by heart either. So um, it, it's a nice to know, not a mandatory. So if we're going to deal with wounds to the neck, uh, wounds to the neck, there's large major vessels, the carotids and the, and the uh, vertebral arteries, as well as the uh, jugular veins, both internal and external jugular veins, which um, Drain the, drain the blood from the brain where the arteries feed the brain. Uh, they cause a potential source for serious bleeding, not to mention we have some pressure in those larger veins that's lower than atmospheric pressure. We can suck in an air bubble from the outside world. So you can suck that air bubble in and we know that that air embolus floating through the body can create all kinds of havoc including a stroke, a heart attack, pulmonary embolus. So the treatment stop the bleeding and prevent any air embolism. Um, this is actually not terribly difficult to try to accomplish. Um, it's simply direct pressure. We're not going to put a tourniquet on this. You cannot tourniquet a patient's neck. So it's direct pressure. Um, and uh, be cautious not to uh, collapse their airway. The other thing is put an occlusive dressing. So an occlusive dressing over the top of your standard gauze um, is a, a wonderful thing. So if we have put this occlusive dressing over there to prevent that air from getting sucked in. And again, use your flapper valve if necessary. Um, in most cases, it's not something you're going to have to worry about, but I would still leave a corner uh, loose. That way, if air does need to escape, it can. Uh, you have much less of a risk of causing a tension new more uh, from a neck wound than you do from an actual chest wound. So that treatment, again, ensure the open airway, place the gloved hand over the wound, apply your occlusive dressing, you can apply pressure to stop that bleeding, bandage it in place, and then if the mechanism suggests it, um, immobilize. So injuries to the spine. Uh, assume that possible cervical spine injuries if the mechanism of injury exerts great force on the upper body or if the soft tissue damage to the head or face or neck. You got to be you just have to be safe. And if your patient's not completely alert and completely oriented, you should probably be on the cautious side and immobilize the spine. Because not immobilizing the spine, uh, you run that risk of, oh, there actually is an injury there, and now whammo. Um, the, the patient, uh, uh, something slipped, something moved, and now the patient uh, is paralyzed. Uh, the spinal cord is that relay between most of the body uh, and the brain for sending messages. And remember that neurogenic shock, this is a form of shock, uh, resulting from the nerve paralysis can cause uncontrolled dilation of the blood vessels. So it's like we cut the phone line. And if the phone line was feeding the message to your leg veins and your leg arteries to be small because we were low on blood, um, and now that phone line's cut, and so all those vessels say, oh, well, let's just relax, and everybody dilates, dilates, dilates. Now you get blood stagnating and pooling down there, and it's not getting pushed along. Again, it goes back to our, our uh, uh, analogy of trying to hook up a five-inch fire hose to your spigot uh, at home, trying to water your lawn or wash your car. Eventually, you'll get water out of the other end of it, just not going to get any pressure. So to assess your spinal injury patient, look for paralysis of the extremities. This is normally the, of both extremities. So we talk about both legs or both legs and both arms. Occasionally you get something weird like the arms are paralyzed and the legs are not. Or you might get um, one side of the body is paralyzed and the other side is not. Uh, it's not as typical with the traumatic brain injury as it is with many strokes. Um, because it tends to be a little bit more uh, of a radical um, injury. They may have pain with or without movement, so they may just be complaining of pain along their neck or their, their back. Uh, they can have tenderness anywhere along their spine. Maybe you're just palpating and all of a sudden they, they really start to, to holler out or wince in pain. They can have impaired breathing. Um, if you get fractures up to the third, second, third vertebrae, you can um, damage the phrenic nerve, which controls your diaphragm, and uh, that can impair breathing. 
you, you may have deformity. It would be a little bit more difficult to assess deformity in most cases. Um, so when you uh, get used to running your hand down somebody's spine and feeling all those spiny processes, or spinal processes, um, or vertebral processes, whatever way you want to call them, uh, or the little bony lumps on the back, um, you'll know that, oh, wow, something's missing there. Uh, remember where the last cervical vertebrae transitions to the first thoracic vertebrae, you usually have a normal uh, kind of a step, uh, a little change in, in the height of those. Priapism, remember priapism in the male is the uh, involuntary erection that uh, generally does not go away. So that priapism um, is a lot of times as a result of uh, changes to the nervous systems and then loss of bowel or bladder control in many cases. So to treat our spinal injury patient, we're going to provide manual inline stabilization. Notice that, that does not say traction. It's immobilization or stabilization. We're keeping it still, keeping it from moving. We're not pulling on their head. Traction is pulling. So assess the ABCs. Rapidly assess their head and neck and apply a cervical uh, collar, a rigid cervical collar, if you can. Sometimes we can't. Um, sometimes the patient's head is cocked off in a weird position, and even if we try to move it to a normal, inline, neutral position, it catches or it creates a ridiculous amount of pain. Uh, in those cases, we're going to stop. We're going to mobilize in the position found. Uh, and then rapidly assess the CSM of their extremities. Uh, that tells us a lot. Hey, do we have nervous system uh, communication back and forth right now? We're going to apply the appropriate spinal mobilization device. This is almost always a long spine board, but the route in which we get to the long spine board sometimes changes. Sometimes we put them on a vacuum mattress. It's hard to do that. Um, to go strictly, say, from the floor to the vacuum mattress. So we may have a scoop stretcher involved. We may have a KED or a vest-style device involved. So uh, reassess the sensory, the motor, and the circulatory functions. So anytime you move a patient, you apply a splint, you apply a backboard, a KED, whatever, you're constantly reassessing CSM. Reassess it before you move them, reassess them after you move them. So there's a video on the spinal injuries. So some issues with immobilization. Um, we're always going to try to maintain manual stabilization. Um, the only time we can release manual stabilization uh, is if we're turning it off over to somebody, obviously. Uh, or once we have them fully immobilized to a backboard. And that includes with some um, pads or pillows beside their, um, their heads, some straps and tape holding their head still. Um, and we're going to use this in conjunction with a long spine board. Um, even the KED, there are straps on it. You still hold on with the vest style device uh, until their head is fully immobilized to a long spine board. So to mobilize our seated patient, uh, if we have low priority patients or patients who don't have immediate life threats, we're going to use a short board or a vest style of mobilization device. This does take some time and you can see they have the green thing there positioned behind her is a, uh, it's probably a, a name brand KED, so uh, an official uh, Kendrick extrication device. But uh, this doesn't go in and, and get you out of the car in 30 seconds flat. This is about a five minute procedure to get this thing placed. So if we have a high priority patient, we're going to maintain manual C-spine while we move that patient. We're going to do rapid extrication. It's probably going to include getting a backboard wedged under their butt, doing a, uh, a swivel in the seat, having somebody move legs, try to move her as close to an inline unit as possible out onto the backboard and then immobilized. So to apply our long backboard, if we have a patient who's laying down, uh, log roll your patient. And they leave this out because I, a lot of times they consider it as part of the assessment. But as you log roll that patient up, before you do anything further, you assess the back. So you assess their, their spine. Um, 
if we have a patient with severe trauma, and especially one who can't tell us anything, um, this would be a good time to remove any clothing that's on the back because we want to get as much of that out of there as possible uh, so we can see what we're dealing with. Pad the voids after you log roll the patient back on there. Pad the voids between the board and the head slash torso. So if their head kind of juts forward or in many cases you also have voids under the small of the back. Um, so you have a little bit of space between there. Uh, if you try to lay down on, uh, say, try to lay down on your uh, on any hardwood floors, linoleum or something like that that you may have uh, and try to slide your hand under various parts of your body, you can probably slide your hand underneath the small of your back as well as uh, behind your neck. So those are areas that are voids that we want to pad to keep from uh, you know, having the back sway down like that and get out of alignment. The head is always the last thing to be secured. Just keep in mind when you're securing a patient to a backboard, you immobilize things from heaviest to lightest. So obviously your torso would be the heaviest part of your body. Your second heaviest part of your body would be your legs. And your least heaviest part of your body is your head. So go from heavy to light. Straps, lots of straps, um, no less than three straps to immobilize somebody. If you've got tiger straps, those are great, or, or spider straps, which are a couple of different uh, specific types of straps that uh, make uh, strapping a lot easier. Uh, and if the patient is pregnant, tilt the board to the left after we immobilize. Of course, that's going to require you to have them secured well and their, pad, their voids padded uh, to keep them from rolling around on that backboard. So if they're pregnant, tilt the board to the left after mobilizing. Usually you can roll up a couple of towels and stick them under the right side of the backboard. It allows their body to kind of shift towards the left a little bit, and it keeps the baby off of uh, the greater vessels that kind of cause some trapping of um, most of the vena cava, uh, cause trapping of blood in the lower extremities. We can do a standing backboard. Uh, this requires at least three providers cervical collar and a long backboard. So they approached her, somebody held C-spine, they applied the C-collar, did maybe a quick once over on her, uh, checked her back if necessary, and then positioned the backboard up behind her. And then the two guys get up underneath her arms, basically in her armpits, grab a hold of that backboard, and then they just start to lower it down. You have to do this as a unit. You have to communicate well and I uh, have to have an understanding that the guy who's behind the backboard holding the C-spine is going to have to do some maneuvering to get out from uh, the path that that spine board's coming down in. If we have a patient wearing a helmet, uh, when, uh, when should we leave it in place? Number one, if it fits snugly and doesn't allow for any movement, um, if there's absolutely no impending airway or breathing issues, if removing it would cause further injury uh, and proper spinal mobilization could be done with the helmet in place. So with some of these statements here, um, airway, if we have to worry about the airway, certain types of helmets, this isn't an issue. Um, but if you get a full face helmet, motorcycle helmet, or let's say you have a football helmet on, uh, there's obviously things that impede the airway. Uh, sometimes we have ways around that. Say with a football helmet, um, if you work with your athletic trainers uh, for services that or for uh, sports that you may do standbys on, they'll probably teach you how to quickly remove a uh, face mask. You can do it with a set of trauma shears. It's easier to do with something called a set of bypass pruners that you would use, say, to prune your bushes and your rose bushes and whatnot. Uh, it works a little slicker. And there are some newer um, things out now that basically if you have a uh, needle that you would use to inflate uh, a basketball or a football or you know that size of a, a ball needle um, you can slip that in a little hole it releases a little internal latch and it will allow it to pop off there rather easily and then some places have some kind of special tools but so sometimes we're just going to simply remove that uh, face mask if we can immobilize with the helmet in place and get proper spinal immobilization. Well, if we put a patient, a football player, on a backboard, if we left their shoulder pads in place, it's okay to leave their helmet in place. Um, if this, for some reason the shoulder pads came off before the helmet did, uh, 
um, we probably need to remove the helmet because it's going to the helmet's going to push the head way forward uh, while the back is going to relax back. But the shoulder pads are in place; it keeps the head kind of in a neutral position. So when are we going to remove it? Obviously, it interferes with the airway. It's improperly fitted or it's very loose on their head. It interferes with our immobilization or if we have a cardiac arrest. If the patient's a cardiac arrest, we need to be have access to the airway. Um, so th that helmet is coming off. This is that video on the KED that I mentioned. So we run into the end of the chapter here. So we have the chapter review, the two main divisions of the nervous system being the central and the peripheral nervous systems. Um, Remember to maintain a high index of suspicion for head or spine injury whenever there is a relevant mechanism. Uh, provide that central, or I'm sorry, cervical spine stabilization before the beginning any other patient care uh, when a head or spine injury is suspected. Uh, altered mental status is an early and important indicator of a head injury. And monitor and document your patient's mental status throughout your call. A traumatic brain injury is any injury that disrupts function of the brain and may include anything from a slight concussion to a severe hematoma or bleed in the brain. Um, always secure the torso to the backboard before the head. Remember, it's usually best to do uh, heavy, less heavy, and least heavy. Um, in a key components of the nervous system are the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, these organs regulate our thought, our sensation, and motor functions. Uh, the skull and the vertebrae and cerebral spinal fluid efficiently protect the brain and the spinal cord. In a closed head injury, the skull remains intact. This is dangerous, and for the skull is a closed container, and it leaves very little room for bleeding or swelling. And then we have neck wounds are at risk for massive bleeding and air entry causing an embolus. The spine is most often caused uh, injury, injured by compression or excessive flexion, by extension, by rotation from falls, diving injuries, and motor vehicle collisions. And these injuries can interrupt the nervous system's control of the body functions. Uh, inline mobilization of the 33, 32, 33 spinal bones uh, is essential in, uh, per, in uh, providing appropriate spinal injury immobilization. Specific procedures apply for different immobilization and extrication situations. EMTs need to be proficient in handling the basics of these. So some questions that you should ask your patients, or actually ask yourself about your patients. Does my patient have a mechanism of injury that would indicate the need for spinal mobilization? This has to be a question answered very quickly once you arrive on scene. And then do my patient's potential head or spine injuries require prompt transport to a trauma center? Remember we mentioned when uh, we started the trauma section that we try to stay on scene no, no more than 10 minutes and then get them transported to the hospital. So your critical thinking question, you're treating a patient uh, with a head injury, he has altered mental status and a significant mechanism of injury to the head. Your partner thinks you should hyperventilate. When should you hyperventilate? What are the signs and symptoms that would indicate that this is necessary? One of the things about treating patients with head injuries is they found that a very slight, very, very slight uh, hyperventilation uh, will cause some reduction in swelling. Um, so if you have a patient who has an altered mental status, significant signs of mechanism of injury, you can increase your respiratory rate uh, from about that normal um, 12 per minute uh, up to around 20 or 24 per minute, no more than that. Uh, to help shrink some of those blood vessels a little bit. 